Good morning. I hope you had a good week. We're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 today as we jump back into our study of this book. Paul, if you remember in chapter 2, uh, was really emphasizing the crucial importance of the role of the Holy Spirit in our lives as believers and the power and wisdom that he brings to our daily walk of faith. And Paul now here returns to the issues of the Church of Corinth and their divisions over their preferences for certain human leaders and teachers. So we're going to read all of 1 Corinthians 3 today as we see what the Lord has for us here. But I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it, and even now you are not yet ready, for you are still of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not being merely human? What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, God's building. According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation, and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it, for no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Do you not know that you are God's temple, and that God's Spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him, for God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you thinks that he is wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is folly with God. For it is written, He catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are futile. So let no one boast in men, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas, or the world, or life, or death, or the present, or the future, all are yours, and you are Christ, and Christ is God. Let's pray and thank God for his word. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that your word is truth. We thank you, Lord, uh, that you are the one who has saved us, that you are the foundation of our being and our life, uh, Lord, that you continue to work and move in us and through us for your name's sake. Lord, I pray that we would not be so foolish as to think this is all about us, or that we grow by our own strength, or that the church advances by our own resources. Lord, may we remember what matters most. May we remember that you are the one who makes all things grow. Thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. So church, it is one thing for us to discuss the Spirit, to consider the wisdom of God Almighty, and yet it is another thing to live by faith in accordance to His will instead of our own. Remember at the end of chapter 2, Paul had really laid down an incredible amen sort of passage there on the Holy Spirit. An awesome declaration 
of how the Holy Spirit transforms our lives, giving us access to the very mind of Christ. Incredible. But realize here that Paul then is beginning chapter 3 saying, yeah, but when I look at you, I don't see that. I don't see the wisdom of the Spirit or the mind of Christ in your interactions, in your divisions. You aren't living as spiritual people, but people of the flesh. You're immature, and you're not being led by the Spirit of God. You're still depending upon your own flesh, your own sense of intelligence, and the ways of this world. Paul isn't complimenting them here at all when he compares them to infants unable to eat solid food, still needing baby food, milk. He's saying to the church of Corinth, you guys aren't nearly as mature as you like to think you are. You know, as people, we are often pretty good at identifying immaturity in others, but not so good at evaluating our own level of maturity. But that's also just part of the nature of things. Because it's really hard to recognize somewhere you've never been before. And when it comes to spiritual maturity, God is always leading us forward. He is leading us into new things and new areas of life where we haven't been. Or new experiences or trials through which we haven't yet learned to depend upon Him. New opportunities and challenges where we haven't yet learned to trust Him. New temptations and callings where we haven't yet obeyed him because in and through each and every moment of our lives god is drawing us to himself his spirit is revealing that nature of god to us that we might know him and live in him more and more each passing moment even when god is simply calling us to wait patiently upon him and for his timing even then he is truly drawing our faith to new places of assurances in Him. But you know, far too often, we kid ourselves. And we assume that somehow we've figured something out. We've hit a milestone. We may not be in heaven yet, but we assume surely we've arrived at some sort of significant level of faith. Now hopefully, Christian, you already possess the wisdom from the Lord to know that as long as you are still here, and not there, meaning stand, standing face to face before his presence, you know that God isn't done with you yet. And he is continuing to refine you into the image of his son, as long as you are here. Nonetheless, even knowing this, we are so often tempted to look around and we identify the immaturity in others. And then we sit back and... And we talk to ourselves and we go, well, yeah, I already passed that level. I've got that one figured out. <laughs> or, whew, I'm glad I'm not struggling with what they're struggling with. Or maybe, boy, do they need to study their Bible more so they can understand that doctrine a bit better. We see the flesh in others. We see their need for milk. All while we miss the flesh in ourselves. And we pridefully celebrate maybe even the tiny little bites of meat that our Lord has so graciously chopped up for us to make them easier for us to chew in our own areas of immaturity. You see, Paul points out here, is there not still jealousy among you? Is there not still strife? Are these things really still upsetting you? Are you really making a big deal about this, that, and the other thing? Aren't you just acting like everyone else in the world when you argue and divide yourselves over whether or not you prefer Paul to Apollos or Apollos to Paul? The Holy Spirit was present with them, but they weren't living like it. They had the very wisdom of God, but they were holding on to a different wisdom. Church, let me ask you something. Would you rather be right or wrong? I'm going to assume right. Is it not better to be right than to be wrong? I mean, it is indeed. There's surely nothing wrong with being right, right? But here's the kicker. The more right we grow to be, the more we should recognize just how wrong we actually are. 
Now, hold on. Let me explain what I mean by that. I mean that the more and more that the Lord shows us of himself and brings his righteousness into our lives, the more we come to, to know and understand about God and the more we come to trust him, the more his character and his wisdom are evident in us, the more then we should come to realize just how deep the sin of our hearts and the foolishness of our flesh can go. And the more we should see our need for his grace to be even greater than we could have ever previously perceived or processed. But you know, if we instead consider the areas of our lives where we are convinced that we are right, and maybe we are right, but we take those areas maybe where we're right, and we camp there, and we put down our tent poles and begin to rest in what we believe we already know, instead of continuing to trust God to lead us forward into all that he still has for us, then we will quickly be tempted to slide right back into the very human immaturities that we so confidently criticize in others. This is why Paul reminds them, reminds us, who they are, who he and Apollos truly are, who we all are in Christ. Each of these men that the Corinthians divided over were but faithful servants, obeying the Lord just as their Lord had assigned them to. They were each simply moving forward by faith with their God, as the Lord equipped them to teach and equip the believers in Corinth. None of them, none of them, were truly responsible for the salvation or growth of that church. Sure, Paul had planted the seeds of the gospel, just as the Lord had called him to, and then later Apollos, the gifted teacher that the Lord's Spirit had equipped him to be, had then obediently come and taught the people more about the word of God, watering the soil of their hearts, so to speak. But it was God, and God alone, who had made them grow. It was God who had drew them closer to himself, giving them life, and then daily imparting the very nature and character of his life to them. And church, this is so important for us to understand. God alone grows the church in all the ways and manners that truly mean anything. You know, we can manipulate, compound, and draw numbers. We can check more boxes, hold more events, start more programs, and compile larger crowds of people. But only God grows his church. Only the Lord changes hearts, drawing us to repentance, and then equipping us with all the grace and faith we need to walk faithfully with him, bearing witness to his good news and making disciples. Yet we as the church have always been so tempted to cling to some worldly means, some worldly resource, or, or to human leaders as the basis of our hope for the life and growth of the church. Never mind that it wasn't the skills of the apostles that resulted in 3,000 people being baptized at Pentecost. It wasn't our clever programs that brought about the empty tomb, and we certainly didn't have anywhere near enough money to buy our own redemption. God alone makes it grow. So let us turn to him. Let us seek his will, depend upon his power, and with all faith and obedience, trust that his spirit will work and move just as he said he would and will in and through our lives. We are all but God's fellow workers. We are serving in his harvest field, not ours. No man is responsible for the harvest of the Lord, for it's his just as we are his. As Paul explains here, you are God's field, God's building. The point in all this is quite bluntly, you belong to God, not to yourself or any other man. So why would you continue to build your lives dependent on anyone else but him? You see then in verses 10 through 15 here, Paul paints a really important picture for our understanding of how our lives ought to be built up in faith and how the true nature of our faith and our service unto our Lord will ultimately be revealed and evaluated. Paul explains here how the foundation of our life in the Lord is laid through the grace of God, as God's grace is at work in our hearts and in and through the lives of those who witness to us. A foundation is laid. 
the only foundation that can be laid, Jesus Christ. It is the foundation of the blood of Christ, of his death, resurrection, and all of his promises that is the basis for our life that truly endures. The question then, though, is what are we going to build on that? How is our life to be built in, on, and most importantly, by Christ? You know, far too often we, with all the immature excitement of a child that has no idea what they are getting into, we go, I got this. I'm, I'm pretty good at building. And we just start throwing stuff together. We take whatever looks good to us and we start constructing our lives in the way we think the Lord would probably want us to. With, of course, a few artistic and creative designs of our own making. But church... The reality is that none of us are quite as good at building our lives as we often like to think we are. And the Lord here presents this picture of judgment, of evaluation, of a day when everything that is built in our lives, whether things we've built or things that other people build in our lives as the Holy Spirit leads them, or maybe by their own volition, and how all of these things built in our lives will be tested by fire, and not everything will endure. There will be a day when a great many things that we have spent much of our own time and energy on will be revealed to have little to no value in the grand scheme of eternity and glory of God. Paul isn't saying here that if we waste our lives, we're losing our salvation, as he speaks there as one who endures, but through fire. Uh, the NIV says as one, you know, escaping the flame. It's not a question of salvation, but a question of what have we done with this life that belongs to God? You see, church, Paul explains here that we are a temple. Whose temple? God's temple. As those whose lives have been saved and redeemed by Christ and Christ alone, we are temples of the Holy Spirit. So now the question becomes, who is probably best? At building up God's temple. You or God? God. You know, we are often so quick to make a mess of things. But remember, God knows exactly what he is doing. And he alone is the one who makes it grow. God knows how best to build your life. And he alone knows and possesses the best building materials. The question is... Are we going to actually let him build? You know, you don't have to wait for the day in which you stand before the Lord in glory, for him to show you that which is of your life that doesn't need to be there. If you want to see what the Lord and his mighty power can do, stop building your own life. Humble yourself before him and trust him to build as he sees fit. This can be really tough for us, though, because sometimes there are aspects of our lives that Maybe we're really impressed with, but God goes, you know, hey, that that doesn't need to be there. That doesn't have any value in my kingdom. And then the Lord begins to, as we say, prune a bit, removing things on his foundation in his temple that have no value to the purpose of his temple. God's temple is holy. And as scripture explains here, God does not take well to those who destroy his temple. Will you trust God to build your life his way with his materials? Because God's got a lot better materials than we do. And when the Lord builds his temple on his foundation in our lives, he constructs things that we never thought possible, building up his character, his fruit, and his purposes with his power, growing our faith, our love, our hope, our patience and endurance, our gentleness, our grace, our witness, our service, and our worship in ways that only he can. He builds that which endures forever and brings him glory forever and ever and ever. So don't be deceived, Scripture says. Stop thinking you got this and that you know best how to build your life. The world and all of its folly preaches that you are your own master, that your sense of wisdom, that even your own sense of reality, whatever, whatever that happens to be in any given moment, 
is what is best for you. The wisdom of the world says, build your life however you see fit. But the Lord says, you're mine. I've bought you at a price. I've redeemed you for a far greater purpose than this. And the foundation of your life is Christ. You are God's temple, holy unto him, set apart for the purposes of his glory. And in Christ, Paul explains that all things are yours because you belong to Christ just as Christ belongs to God. In other words, all things are, are, are yours not because of you, but because of him. And in that too, we, we belong to one another because of Christ. And it is Christ and his saving, sanctifying, and glorifying work in our lives that has brought us together for this purpose as God's holy temples. So stop trying to build your own temple and learn to trust what the Lord and his wisdom and grace is building in you for the sake of his far greater and far better purposes. You see, we often want to see God over there. By that I mean, you know, we, we say, God, show me who you are. Reveal yourself to me. We want to see God do something in front of us. We say, God, give me an experience of you that I can see and enjoy. But here's the thing. While God in his grace does at times show himself to us and before us and, and give us some incredible experiences that are just blessings of his grace, God much refers to reveal himself in us, to show himself in his children, in his temple, building his life in you and through you, showing the compassion of his grace and glory of his life in you that his grace would be shown in and through you to others, that as he builds in you, he will use you to build that which he desires also in the lives of others. You are Christ. You belong to him. You are his. You trusted him to save you, right? So now trust him to build his life in you. You belong to him. So stop acting like and living like and building like you belong to anyone else. Let's pray. Lord, I pray today we would quite simply remember whose we are and whom we serve. Lord, forgive us for all the time we spend building our lives and things that are vain and things that are coming to nothing. Remind us, Lord, that we are your temple, that we are holy unto you, and Lord, that you know best how to build your temple, how to use your temple, how to move and work for the sake of your glory in your temple. Lord, I pray today that we would be quick to humble ourselves before you, to seek you instead of our own wisdom to patiently wait upon your leading instead of rushing ahead in our folly, to trust that you will show yourself faithful in and through our lives as you shower us and lavish us with your grace, that your spirit will build up your fruit in and through us. Lord, may you be made known and be made great in your temple in these lives of ours that you have redeemed for your purposes. Thank you, Lord, that we are yours and yours forever. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Go in the grace and peace of Christ and remember that you're his temple this week.